Hello again, I'm Kai Fitzik, the physics instructor here at FSI. Um, now I'm ready to present Diana and Caleb, who did an experiment involving dimpling uh, using a wind tunnel. Um, so my name is Diana. And I'm Caleb Wright. And we are going to be talking to you about dimpling and our, our project on dimpling with wind tunnels and projectiles. Um, basically, what, we're trying, what we were trying to look at was the effects of golf ball style dimpling on the aerodynamics of aircraft. Uh, and so, first, we'll give you a brief history of golf ball dimpling. Um, so, originally, golf balls were smooth, uh, they were actually made out of uh, feathers and leather. Uh, golfers eventually noticed that more beat up golf balls would fly further and react the way that they wanted them to. Um, they were more smooth in the air. Uh, and so eventually those become the prefer became the preferred type. There are two theories on why golf balls that are beat up work better. Uh, we, were only tested, we were only testing one of those. The first theory was that the backspin on the ball uh, caused increased air pressure under the ball. Uh, and that's... So basically, you can see that basically, like with, with a smooth ball, the all of the air flows equally around it and makes this uh, path of drag behind it. Uh, whereas with a golf ball, it has those dimples. So when the golf when the golf ball has backspin, it pulls the air around and makes this high pressure area back here, which lifts the ball. The next style that we were testing was, or this is the style the style that we were actually testing, which was uh, the turbulent boundary layer. Uh, when a smooth ball moves through the air, it has this separated flow back there, and there's not very much turbulent air behind it, so it causes a lot of drag. There's kind of a low pressure air pocket there. It's almost like a vacuum, just sucking the ball back to where it was. Um, uh, with a golf ball, the uh, what they think that happens with a golf ball is uh, those tiny pockets in the golf ball cause the air to become turbulent, and that turbulent air filters back into that space and uh, makes that space smaller. So it decreases the overall drag, although it does increase the drag on the surface of the golf ball. So basically what we are going to test, or what we did test, was two different projectiles. And we dimpled them with clay, and our concept was the clay smoothly. So our hypothesis was based on how um, there was a show on Discovery Channel, the Mythbusters, and basically they dimpled a car. So our and oh sorry, so they dimpled a car and it went from 26 miles per hour to 29 miles per hour per gallon. So basically, what we decided is that if we dimple that the two projectiles, that they will work. And so the materials that we needed, we ended up doing two different projects. We needed to make the wind tunnel itself and then the testing. So for the testing, we needed the two projectiles, which was a rocket nose cone and then a rocket body. And then we used the Vernier Lab Pro. And it basically had a force meter attached to it, which would pull our rocket. So the methods and the procedures. Um, so like I said, we had two different projects. It took about 30 hours to make our wind tunnel, and it took about six to seven hours to do our results. So up there is the cone for our um, for our wind tunnel, and that was basically where the fan went to push the air into the tunnel. And that is our tunnel, and this is all made by plywood and support beams. And the straws, and the straws are very critical for the wind tunnel because it makes our choppy air, which was the turbulent, into smooth air, which would push the rocket evenly, so it wouldn't be moving around. All right, so the two different types of air that we're talking about, those straws that you saw, uh, basically whenever air comes out of a fan, it's choppy. The air is essentially, essentially being chopped up by the fan and thrown. Uh, so there's all these different sections, uh, and if you've ever stood in front of a fan, you'll notice that it's like, uh, the air hits you in waves. It doesn't hit you all smoothly. Um, so those straws, basically what they did is they took those sections and broke them up into tiny, tiny little bits of air and then threw them out 
So that swirling air became smooth and uh, took it from turbulent flow to laminar flow with the uh, straws. That was the original design of our wind tunnel. Uh, we didn't actually end up using that design. We'll show you here in a minute. Um, before we tell you about that, we have to tell you about dimples, car dimpling carbon nanotubes and uh, noise. The uh, first thing is carbon nanotubes. And, uh, carbon nanotubes, you may say, well, what does a carbon nanotube have to do with a golf ball? Carbon nanotubes themselves don't. The pattern of carbon nanotubes do. Uh, those are the three patterns that we use for our golf balls. Uh, armchair, zigzag, and chiral. Um, and I believe that's uh, chiral uh, dimpling on the rocket. Uh, there were several complications in the process, the biggest of which was our fan failure. We attached our fan to our, uh, our wind tunnel and put a string in there to see how, how straight the flow was, and the string didn't even move. So. We found out we had to get a, a higher power fan. Uh, another challenge was balancing the aircraft. The aircraft always had to be on its balance point so that it wasn't dragging differently in the wind tunnel. Uh, the height in the tunnel, the aircraft had to be, the, the, the projectile had to be in the direct center of the tunnel. And the dimpling accuracy, that kind of, uh, we, because we did it in clay and we did it by hand, there were definitely inaccuracies. We couldn't do it by computer. Um, the aircraft weight distribution, basically the clay wasn't all even throughout the uh, models. And noise, and I'm about to explain what noise is here in a second. Um, this is what our uh, fan ended up looking like. It was a flood drying fan. We just attached a plastic bag to it. We measured the wind speed to make sure that it wasn't changing anything. And uh, 6.3 meters per second wind speed, and we tested it in different parts of the tunnel to make sure that it wasn't uh, higher, low, higher wind speed at a lower altitude or lower, higher, anything like that. So one thing that we also ran across was noise. We found out that when we started testing, when we didn't even have wind blowing, uh, we'd start getting these inputs. And uh, it, was a, an output, or it was an output of data, a semi-random output of data with zero input. So we weren't doing anything, but it was reading data. Uh, and if you see, there were tiny little corruptions even in the noise. Uh, so if you zoom in on those, that's what those corruptions look like. It made almost a sinusoidal graph. And those are the points that we highlighted in the other one. Uh, so we had to account for noise in our testing. Um, so right here you can see NZ, that's noise. Before we tested each uh, projectile, first we would do a noise test, then we would test the projectile. Then we'd do another noise test, and then we'd test the projectile. We had to do this throughout the entire test for two different projectiles and three dimpling styles. So SM is smooth dimpling, dimpling one, dimpling two, dimpling three. That's the zigzag chiral armchair. Um, good. Then we took all of those and we averaged them out and had to find a way to take the noise out of the equation. Um, so for rocket one, you'll see you'll see that we have the constant, the dimpling one, dimpling two, and dimpling three. The first column is the noise. The second column is the actual testing. And those are the minimum, maximum, standard devi deviation. And for rocket two, we had the same thing, the constant with the noise and averages uh, with the actual tunnel testing. Um, after we gathered all of our data, I'll show you why, but the hypothesis was rejected. It was slimly rejected. Um, if you see right here, this shows drag in Newtons for rocket one was smooth, dimpling one, dimpling two, dimpling three. Uh, the most interesting point is the smooth uh, in Newtons versus the smooth, or versus dimpling three, which was chiral in Newtons. That's a two ten thousandths of a Newton difference between smooth and uh, non-smooth. And it was even more interesting when our drag on rocket two had the same increment. So it was two ten thousandths of a Newton difference. Um, also another thing that we were measuring was wobble. And these lines are when the wind tunnel was completely off and we were measuring noise. 
So you can see how those don't move very much. But when we turn the wind tunnel on, you can see that it uh, becomes more sporadic. We found out that the standard devi deviation was actually showing us how much the projectile was wobbling inside of the wind tunnel. And so right here, this is rocket one, rocket two. And the control test in Newtons versus dimpling, we looked at that and we said, well, it's two ten thousandths off. We can probably use that as a data set. And then we realized that they were both different sized projectiles and they were both uh, the same difference, uh, but they had different, different amounts of pressure on them. So then we took a percentage and we found out that with dimpling one, this is the percentage away from the control. Um, dimpling one was 67% away, 20%, and then dimpling three in both cases was, was about half a percentage point away from the control. So it was almost just as good as the smooth rocket. So in conclusion, we opposed the hypothesis. We said that it wasn't valid. Um, the projectiles with the smooth side and the chiral projectiles were very, very close. Uh, but because of inaccuracies in clay modeling and because the wind tunnel wasn't a very, uh, it wasn't professionally built and we had strings attaching all of these things together, we said that it was uh, very possibly fluctuations in just the actual conditions of the wind tunnel. So we can't definitively prove or disprove that chiral was more or less effective than smooth. And we would also like to add that if we could make this better, we would end up getting a better force system or something to measure the force. Because as you guys did notice, the points were super, super close. And that was only because of the fact that, like we said, there was many factors that could have resulted in that, such as how it was placed, how it wobbled. So that's what we would change. And then, Caleb? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to especially thank uh, Frank and Gloria Walsh. Uh, they've helped me with a ton of stuff. Um, the Kinder Morgan Fow Foundation and, of course, the Powell family. And for my my sponsors, I had the Adolf Course Foundation and Excel Energy for my research. My principal, Michelle Kelly, paid most of the money. And then my teachers, Kate Sorensen, Alyssa Quijano, Jennifer... Bowen, Eric, Eric Nyan, Philip Shu, Joe Hayes, Kate Buckus, Christy Earhart, Sarah Hoffman, Craig Blazer, and Dave Thompson all added down to that. And we'd especially like to thank the University of Northern Colorado for letting us uh, use their physics lab and uh, math office and Frontiers of Science Institution, um, or Frontiers of Science Institute. Uh, Lori Ball, especially, for letting us come to this and inviting us, and uh, Karen, or, or Karen, Kai, uh, and Ben. Ben helped us with all of our cutting and everything. Uh, he was really great when it came to everything, and Kai was great, too. She was she helped so much with everything. Um, Dr. Cmac, especially, too, helping us get all of our graphs figured out, and looking at that noise and trying to figure out what was going on, and uh, Dr. Galovich as well. So. And this is our reference page. All right. Thanks. Thank